Good afternoon, I'm Wei, and very excited to be here moderating a session um, of which the topic seems to have the most mobilizing power in our community, believe it or not. Um, here's how our session is going to proceed. First, each of our panelists will give us a five to eight minute presentation. And following that presentation will be panel discussion in which I will ask each of them a set of questions. And they will have eight minutes to discuss and uh, answer those questions. Um, other panelists can comment as well, but please keep in mind uh, that panelists only have eight minutes in total, so you might want to uh, limit your commenting time to one minute to two. Uh, we want to control the entire panel discussion time under 40 minutes. So we, we reserve the last 10 to 20 minutes to our QA uh, with our audience. Um, if you have questions, um, our volunteers would be coming around to di distribute some index card so you can write down your specific questions. If there are a lot, a lot of questions, we cannot guarantee every question will be answered, will be asked and answered. <laughs> um, but we'll do, do our best to consolidate um, so we can cover as much as um, content in the last 20 minutes. All right, let's get it started. Um, our first one is Professor Julie Park. All right, thank you so much. Hello, UCA, and thank you so much for the kind invitation to be here today. This is a topic that um, I've been studying for the last 14 years. I'm a professor up the road at the University of Maryland College Park. I teach courses on race and diversity in higher education. I oversee our admissions, um, actually at the graduate school level for my program. And also I teach a course on Asian Americans and education for the undergraduate level. So if any of you are local here, maybe one of your kids will take my course one day. Uh, this is a topic that I know that many people have a lot of fierce opinions about, but if you talk to two people about affirmative action, you might find that they're actually talking about two totally different things. And so there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I hope as an academic and a researcher to provi provide some information that can help give you some clarity um, on these issues. So before I proceed, I need to give the disclosure. Uh, because of my work, uh, extensive research in this area, um, I worked as a consulting expert on the case on the side of Harvard. But the views that I'm talking about today are views that I had prior to that work, um, and they are my own and do not reflect anything learned uh, during the course of my engagement. All right, so what is affirmative action? You know, I think today, and we have a diverse panel here, you're going to hear affirmative action referred to by a lot of different names. And language matters. We all know terminology matters. And so I think uh, some of my colleagues might use language like racial preferences or even quotas. And that is language that I actually find to be very problematic and not reflective of what affirmative action is. At that level of higher education, what affirmative action is, or what we often call it, is race conscious admissions policies. And it constitutes the ability to recognize or consider race as one of many, 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 many factors in just understanding who an applicant is and the context from which he or she came. In the most recent Supreme Court ruling affirm affirming affirmative action, uh, Justice Kennedy noted that the University of Texas Austin in utilizing race conscious admissions policies when they consider race it was but quote a factor of a factor of a factor so I think that's something that's important to clear up because oftentimes there's the misconception that oh affirmative action means that if you are black you get in or that if you're Latino you get in or if you're of some background you automatically get in that's absolutely false and it's simply illegal um, that's not something that can happen Along with that, it's important to recognize that affirmative action is not a quota, a requirement, or cap 
Quotas have been illegal in the United States in relation to higher education since 1978 with the Supreme Court's ruling in the Bakke case. Um, there are no caps or ceilings, but this is once again an area where there's been a lot of misinformation. I've heard people say, well, did you know the UC system, they have a limit to how many Asian Americans they can admit. That's absolutely false and illegal, and if any university was trying to employ that type of policy, it would be identified pretty quickly. And admissions officers and offices, this isn't news to them. They know that and they want to obey the law. They don't want to be sued because it creates a lot of hassle for them. Affirmative action. Some people might make you think it's a formula or some sort of automatic consideration. In fact, race conscious admissions policies are flexible. They are not formulas and they are highly context dependent. One example of that is myself. I benefited deeply from affirmative action because I went to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee on a full scholarship that was in part, which, which was dedicated to recruiting more minority students to Vanderbilt. And so while a place like Harvard might not have that type of scholarship, race conscious admissions policies allow a place like Vanderbilt, which wanted to very much be intentional about diversifying its student's body, student body, to be able to have that type of scholarship, which is only legal under the current law, which protects race conscious admissions. Lastly, I want to note that uh, race conscious admissions and affirmative actions, it does not mean that different groups need different test scores. So that's another misconception. I know there's a lot of um, sort of rumors or sort of the word that, oh, Asian Americans need higher test scores to get into colleges. Now, it is a different thing to note that on average, Asian Americans do have higher standardized test scores. But that does not mean that such scores are required because at the end of the day, no test score guarantees admissions to any type of university in the United States and especially at the highly selective level. So once again, affirmative action does not mean that any group needs higher test scores simply because tests, the way test scores work in our highly competitive ad admissions system is that it's a piece of information, but it's not the sole determining factor. And I think that's really important for us as Asian Americans to understand, especially some of us um, with connections to Asia or um, the first generation, especially who went to college in Asia, where admissions is based solely on a test score, right? The exam entrance scores in Korea, Taiwan, China, everywhere. Okay, so moving along. With affirmative action, what it opens the doors to and the type of policy that's used at elite colleges is called, called generally holistic admissions. And basically what that is, it's looking at students and looking at their entire portfolio, who they are, what they might contribute to a student body. So it's not just their SAT scores and it's not just their GPA. Within Harvard, they have plenty and plenty of applicants who apply who have perfect test scores and GPAs. And Harvard doesn't necessarily, necessarily want to fill their entire class with valedictorians. It's interesting. I'm from Ohio, and at my local high school, I knew of at least four or five people who went from my high school to Harvard, and they were all Asian American. But you want, know what? None of them were valedictorian. None of them were even salutatorian. I think they were all like, fourth, somewhere in that. Uh, but what this holistic admissions review policy allows is for a, a university to look at an applicant and say, hey, like what sorts of special talents might they have? What sorts of other things? In general, they do need to have strong test scores and strong GPAs. But when you have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of students who already have those strong test scores and GPAs, at that level, then colleges start looking at what else distinguishes this student. So one of my favorite examples to use is one of my heroes, Jeremy Lin, uh, who I know um, is someone very popular within the Asian American community. Uh, people have generally gauged that his SAT scores were somewhere around in the 1400s. And so by conventional wisdom, people would say, he shouldn't go to Harvard, right? He wasn't valedictorian. He doesn't have a test score. But come on, he's Jeremy Lin. He obviously had special talents. And definitely, we know that through his contributions in philanthropy and other things, had a lot to offer both to the student body and society. So this is how admissions is generally working. Now let's get to the data. In terms of the Harvard admit rate, um, over five years from 2014 to 2019, the overall acceptance rate was 
5.15 for Asian Americans, and it was 4.91% for white students. Within that white student, within those samples, that excludes students who were legacies, um, athletes, or on a special consideration dean's list. So when you're really comparing apples to apples, Asian Americans and white students who are being considered in the same way in the admissions process, the admissions rate for Asian Americans was actually slightly higher. Another important thing to note is that we have research by Thomas Espen Shade, um, who many of you might be familiar with his name, that shows that low income Asian Americans receive a considerable boost in um, highly selective admissions processes. So I know a concern for many people is that they say, you know, there are a lot of poor Asian Americans. There are a lot of low income Chinese Americans. We don't want them to get shut out by affirmative action. Well, it's important to note that affirmative action actually opens the door for low income students of color, including Asian Americans at schools like Harvard. It's also important to recognize that there's been a lot of press around this so-called personal rating. What's the personal rating? I might address this more on the panel because I'm running out of time, I think. Um, but it's important to note the personal rating was, is not a personality score. There are so many myths related to the personal rating. The personal rating instead is an overall score that includes things like the essay, it includes things like teacher recommendations, it includes things like socioeconomic status and contextual factors. Um, and so it's not a personal score. So at the end of the day, Harvard accepts under 5% of students many students are not going to get in of all races. So yes, it's not always the valedictorian who gets in. It's important for us also to recognize when we think about what type of society we want to build together and we want to prepare our children for citizenship in a diverse democracy. And so Asian Americans really benefit from race conscious admissions. We have tons of research that shows that Asian Americans benefit from learning in a diverse student body. And so if we want the best possible learning environment for our students, we need to consider the importance of being able to use these policies that can help support racial ethnic diversity. Additionally, Asian Americans and Chinese Americans be can benefit directly from race conscious admissions policies. Things like minority fellowships, which seek to boost representation in different fields where Asian Americans might be underrepresented, those are only possible because of affirmative action. So in conclusion, um, I have looked at the expert reports up and down backwards and forwards. I looked at the reports filed on both sides by economists. I drowned in the data. I can't go into it in detail, but I do not see evidence of systemic bias or discrimination against Asian Americans. So I come to get to you today first as an expert, yes, as a researcher, a PhD, and a data nerd, but I'm also a mom. I have a son who's half Korean and half Chinese American, and you know that when you become a parent, it changes everything, and you want the best for your child. If I felt these policies were unfair, I would fight them, no question about it. But with my research background, that enables me to see that these policies are so important to create the best possible learning envir environments for our children to benefit from. Thank you. Also, I have a book coming out in a few weeks if you want to learn more about this. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very passionate and informative presentation. Our next one is Brenda. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this important conversation. I realize that this has become a very divisive issue, not just within the Asian American uh, community, but within our larger um, community as well, as we really struggle to understand the extent to which race plays a role in the um, allocation of opportunity and social m mobility. I mean, at the heart of this case is a question about whether Harvard should continue to value racial and ethnic diversity in ways that our country has failed to do, uh, you know, using it as an opportunity to bridge racial divides and recognizing the complex and nuanced ways that race continues to influence our identity and shape our life experience. Along with the, um, our co-counsel at the Asian Americans Advancing Justice, we represent a racially and ethnically diverse group of students and alum at Harvard who seek to protect Harvard's ongoing ability to consider race to the full extent allowed by law. 
These students who identify as Asian American, Black, Latino, Native American, and Pacific Islander assert that Harvard actually needs to do more, not less, to ensure that underrepresented minority groups enroll in greater numbers in order to fully harness the educational benefits of diversity. We understand that SFFA alleges that Harvard's holistic admissions policies discriminate against Asian American applicants. But first, it's important to note that as schools become more selective, the admission process and application review process becomes increasingly complex. And for most competitive schools, including Harvard, in addition to the standard admission criteria, such as academic um, achievement or standardized test scores, there are additional institutional priorities, including athletics, demographics, legacy or sibling connections, your area of intended concentration or major, an area of intended major, um, your uh, socioeconomic status, the rigor of your high school curriculum, any unusual talent um, or ability that uh, contributes to your life experience, all of those things uh, uh, provide some additional criteria that are very important to all of our institutions. SFFA here is seeking to use Asian American Americans as a cover um, to force our colleges and universities to ignore the fact that minorities, including Asian Americans, encounter structural racism and implicit bias because of their racial and ethnic identity. SFF bases its claims of discrimination almost entirely on statistical analysis that does not offer a legally sufficient evidence, any, does not offer legally sufficient evidence of discrimination. And I understand that many of you here may believe that um, Harvard as well as our other um, elite institutions are engaged in discrimination, but I think it's important for you to understand that that is a legal term that has some legal significance and there is no, um, as, as my colleague has already mentioned, there's actually no evidence um, in the record that is indicative of intentional or uh, intentional discrimination or disparate impact that disadvantages our Asian American applicants. As we've moved beyond racial remediation um, as the justification for affirmative action, um, we have come to understand that the constitutionally permissible um, use of race in admissions is really focused on the educational benefits of diversity that um, uh, was already mentioned. And over the last 15 years, as recently as 2016, we know that the Supreme Court has consistently held that the limited and narrowly tailored use of of race in college admissions is entirely consistent with the Constitution. Uh, oh, I didn't realize you, I actually am not having any luck moving this forward, but oh, here we go, sorry. Should I go, okay. As an initial matter, applicants receive five ratings at Harvard, the academic rating, an athletic rating, extracurricular rating, personal rating, and an overall rating. And was already, as uh, was already mentioned, the personal rating has been highly controversial, and it does include consideration of um, an applicant's intended major, their career interests, life experience, socioeconomic status, teacher, teacher and counselor recommendations, the alumni evaluations, if there are any, um, additional character aspects, awards, essays, and leadership, but the personal rating does not, in fact, consider race. The overall rating that is applied to every applicant um, may include a consideration of race, and that rating is intended to offer the, admission com the admissions committee a whole picture snapshot of a, what a student or an applicant might bring to Harvard's campus and learning environment. Harvard does not and uh, is not required to use a formula or any type of algorithm for the variety of factors that influence um, a student's background and life experience. And there is no evidence in the record to date of a separate admissions process or some sort of separate admissions criteria for any group of students. And there is absolutely no evidence that students within a racial group or an ethnic category are forced to compete against each other for a limited number of seats that are allocated to that group. As was already mentioned, um, there are 
are probably, uh, this is an, a, an extremely selective institution. There are more than 40,000 applicants to Harvard who are academically qualified and competing for fewer than 2,000 seats. More than 8,000 of the domestic applicants had perfect GPAs. More than 3,400 had perfect SAT math scores and more than 2,700 applicants had perfect SAT verbal scores. So in average, so as you can tell, um, if you were to select uh, applicants simply by virtue of grades or standardized test scores, you would already have an oversubscribed class. So how does uh, race play into um, admissions at Harvard? Harvard's consideration of race and admission allows it to consider an applicant's racial experience or the way in which race has shaped the applicant's identity. It does not allocate any kind of bonus point or penalty due to an applicant's racial or ethnic category itself. A student's race or ethnicity alone does not represent a positive or negative factor in the admissions process. I was going to also mention that admissions officers use that personality rating in order to capture the essence of what an applicant can contribute to the college campus and really is intended to look at things like grit or passion um, and is not uh, a reflection of the candidate's race or ethnicity. I do think it's important to note just a couple of things since I'm running out of time. Um, SFFA, SFFA's arguments are based on a faulty premise that grades and test scores alone should provide objective criteria that define merit, but what they fail to acknowledge is that these criteria are subject to their own biases that tend to penalize other racial minorities such as African Americans, Hispanics, and other disadvantaged groups. It can also disadvantage um, subgroups of Asian American populations, and the research is very clear that standardized tests are tainted by racial bias and often f depress the scores of people with color, um, people of color. But I think it's also really important to understand that there's very good research that also shows that standardized test scores and high school grade point average are very poor indicators and have um, very limited predictive value in terms of how a student will perform in terms of future academic achievement or other measures of life, life success. Um, before I conclude, sorry, we're going in the wrong direction. I think it's really important um, to reiterate that there is no evidence of racial balancing. SFFA's arguments reveal a fundamental misunderstanding of the way that college admissions work um, more generally, but at Harvard more specifically. And contrary to their claims that Harvard targets a total number of students by race, Harvard, like every other college or university, simply tracks and targets offers of admission based on predicted yield rates to ensure that it is not making more offers of admission than students um, can actually enroll. And so, like most schools, Harvard uses a variety of information to estimate the expected yield for different subgroups of students and applicants, and there is absolutely no evidence um, that has been submitted that race plays an outsized or a legally impermissible role in this analysis. Um, and I think that uh, because of time issues, I will stop there. Um, but I would uh, encourage you all to ask me any questions either during the panel or after about um, uh, the UNC case as well as the Harvard case. Thank you. A lot of good information. <laughs> Our next presenter is Mike. Uh, he's preferred to be addressed as Sir Mike, excellence. <laughs> That's what you told me. My mic is fine. Uh, how do I? Uh, how, how do I just click this? Okay. So thank you all of you for being here. It's a very nice day. Uh, by, by the way, I'm going to keep looking at my iPhone because I want to stay within the eight minutes that I've been allotted. I'm going to disagree with my two predecessors uh, strongly, uh, but I I hope to disagree agreeably. I know that all of you following the news will know this, but it's too much polarization as it is in our country. I think this issue of, Chinese, of discrimination against 
the children of Chinese Americans, I, I, you know, applying to college is really important. And it, let's call it for what it is. It is discrimination, and, and it, it, it reveals what mayhem, what mischief we create when we get the government involved in creating racial categories and assigning penalties and benefits to members of categories. Because that's what's taking place here. The children, that's not obfuscated, the children of Chinese Americans, when they apply to Harvard, when they apply to elite schools, are being discriminated against. They're being penalized. The leaders of your organization should be supporting you, not Harvard, not Yale, not, not this unfair system. And I'm not going to refer to it as affirmative action. I'm gonna to refer to it for what it is, racial preference. To me, somebody who's an American because he's either born here or becomes a citizen is an American. An American, period. And an American deserves to be treated like an American, like anybody else. So in answer to the extent to which race should play a role in allocating opportunity, it should play zero role. Uh, you know, uh, to, a factor of a factor of a factor is way too much already. Um, so we create a lot of problems when we do this, so I agree here with uh, former Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, you know, this is, we create mischief. This is the problem, so we do when we do this. Uh, this is a very recent problem that we created, these, these groups. The groups I'm referring to, obviously, are Asian, Hispanic, Pacific Islander, groups that were mentioned here before. And it wasn't just, it's not bad enough that the government creates the groups, but then when it compounds the problems by giving them protected status, we have uh, an even worse problem. And, and so the members of new groups receive benefits as a consequence of group affiliation. That's really a lot of mischief. So this is what Scalia said in one of the cases. I completely agree with him. Um, by the way, these groups that we have created make no sense. You know very well that Asian Americans makes very little sense. Chinese Americans have uh, very different cultural indicators from Indian Americans, Malaysian Americans, Laotian Americans, and so forth, uh, different uh, uh, household income, mortality rates. With Hispanics, it's even worse. Uh, we have created this huge umbrella uh, that, that has people of any race, uh, white, black, Asian, uh, somebody of the original peoples of the Americas, can come on, under this umbrella. And by virtue of somebody being assigned to this group, they have an advantage when they are applying to a college, um, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis -vis somebody who's de deemed Asian. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether this quote-unquote Hispanic is the son or daughter of a lawyer or a millionaire or a doctor, and the other quote-unquote Asian is the son or daughter of a Chinese-American laborer or factory worker. Um, This is, um, uh, let's consider how we got here. In 1978, the Supreme Court decided in a, in a case known as the Regents of the University of California versus Bakke, known as the Bakke decision, you may have heard of it that way, held that the goal of diversity, I think one of the speakers referred to it earlier, was sufficiently compelling for race to be considered in admissions. Uh, more striking was the conclusion of the 2003 Grutter versus Bollinger, when the court determined that, quote, the educational benefits that flow from an ethnically diverse student body represented a compelling state interest that justified the use of race in admissions. Now, what happens when we have that? Any, when we, uh, some of the previous speakers have referred to this. Any system that seeks diversity as an end in itself will devolve into group proportionalism. What is group proportionalism? Uh, that, that means that the number of the members of a given group must have some resemblance to the percentage, the proportion of that group in the base population, in the American population. Um, the Supreme, so it, that is very difficult to do. That is what we do when we seek, you know, set out to reach a diversity for diversity's sake. But it's very difficult to do unless you use quotas. Um, and as somebody mentioned here earlier, quotas are unconstitutional. So that's the problem that we get into. And what we're going to find out in the Harvard case is whether Harvard was indeed using quotas illegally to 
keep down the number of Asian American students and try to inflate the, the number of other populations. Uh, but if you are a member of a group that is only 5.6% of the population, which is the case for Asian Americans, a, it's a, this search for diversity is not going to be very good for you because you know 5.6% of the population is not great and it's you know when you have if you have a fort if, 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 the, if the share of the Asian student body at Harvard is 43% as Harvard's own study from 2013 showed and they tried to keep it hidden would be the case if only uh, if only ed educational achievement uh, uh, the SAT scores was used as a criteria, it would be 43%. If that were the case, that would not be very diverse when you compare it to 5.6% of the population being Asian American. So that's the only outcome we can have when we say, seek out to do what Grutter uh, told us to do. Um, but consider what this does, by the way, to the people in whose name this system has been put into place because it's actually even worse. You have heard of mismatch theory. Mismatch theory is the theory that if you have not been in a very competitive environment in K through 12, once you get into an elite school where kids have been very competitive, you're not going to be do, you're not gonna, gonna do very well. You're not, you know, in competition, you're not gonna do very well. You're gonna be frustrated, you're gonna be angry. You're either gonna drop out or you're going to go to an easier major. So we end up, you end up having with fewer doctors, fewer scientists for given populations as a result. The other one that you may not hear about so much is the earned success story. Oh, I have to hurry up here. If you belong to one of the groups in whose name racial preferences uh, are erected, people will say to you, you risk, you run the risk that for the rest of your life, people will say to you, you know, you only got to Harvard or Columbia where I went because of your last name, because of the group you belong to. And this would be awful. You're gonna feel really bad, especially if you were a great student and you did your homework and you busted your butt and you, and you got great grades. That people will think this of you will be awful. But the, the worst one is the group spokesman theory. As, you know, I, I think Brenda referred to, you know, what, uh, the, 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 what is the racial experience? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't go to Columbia to share my racial experience or my background experience. I went there as an individual. And I, this system robs you of our individuality, especially if it's a group foisted upon you. So let's get to really what, 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 how do we get success in this country? We get success through hard work, putting a premium on education, and keeping families intact. These are the numbers. Asian Americans do really well. This is the out of wedlock rate. Only 12%. The other groups don't do as well. Much lower for Asian Americans than for other groups. The divorce rate among women, 35 to 39, it's the same for all age cohorts. But I just wanted to use one. Very low for Asian Americans, very high, unfortunately, for everybody else. And this is the percentage of children growing up in a married couple, in a household with a married couple. Well, what is that? What, let's, let's look at education. This is the average hour spent in homework. The Asian Americans do spend a lot more time doing homework than other, than other groups. And the, the, the dropout rate is also much lower. Look, I am, I'm an immigrant. I'm an immigrant like many of you. We're lucky to live in a country where working hard, doing your homework, putting a premium on education gets you success. That doesn't mean that, there, that racism doesn't exist. The racism is real and it's awful. But it's, it doesn't need to be an obstacle to success. And you know it because many of you are successful. Racism, it's, it's, a, it's a real thing. It's a real bad thing. But if you work, if you work hard and you put a premium on education, you get to succeed in the country's hours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your, your slides are fantastic. I love them. <laughs> Our last one, but not least, is Yin Ma. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so, the others, it's the other way oh, it's this way. Right. Okay. Um, 
Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's, uh, I am really honored to speak to all of you, and I want to give Paul, Lee, a special thanks for introducing me to this organization. Um, I, uh, for the fir when I first worked on this issue, it was in 1996, and I campaigned for a ballot initiative in California called Proposition 209. It was known at the time as the California Civil Rights Initiative, and what it did was it prohibited the state of California from discriminating against California citizens and residents on the basis of race, ethnicity, country of origin, as well as gender in the areas of contra public contracting, public employment, and public education. And as a result of that initiative passing, lots and lots and lots of Asian American kids have been able to get into the elite universities of the California state system, uh, universities such as UC Berkeley, UCLA, in numbers far greater than they were able to do before that initiative passed in 1996. So we made history in that year, and since then, that initiative has been reproduced in nearly 10 states across the country, um, and we've seen real results. But I bring that up here because I remember during that time that when I spoke to the Asian community, that it was a community that was not especially politically mature, and I think that is still the case today. However, I am just so heartened to see so many of you here because for a very long time in this country, the people who claim to speak for Asian Americans tend not to know very much about first generation Asian Americans, and that is especially true in the Chinese American community. And so I am thrilled to see so many of you here who speak the Chinese language, who are first generation immigrants, and who have been incredibly successful in your fields. And I say that not because I I think that you all agree with each other, but I do think that language is a key part of culture. And culture matters when it comes to having political opinions. Having a shared immigrant experience matters. And I think it matters because you probably don't want people who don't know anything about your experience, don't know anything about your struggles and the sacrifices you've made particularly to make your kids more competitive in the university admissions process. You don't want people like that speaking on your behalf. And so I am thrilled to be here, to, and, and I am grateful for this exchange here because obviously there are different views, but, but I think it is very important for folks like you to be, to be included in this political conversation because I think for far too long folks like you have been silent. So I am grateful for all of you and for this particular organization and, 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 you know, and, and grateful to you guys for having me here today. Um, I want to, um, um, I, I think it is key for us to get some of the language correct and I think for far too long the word diversity has been used as if it's some kind of idea and it sounds great but in in reality, in reality, particularly for university admissions, racial diversity has really been a sham. It is an excuse to discriminate against people, and it is especially an excuse to discriminate against Asian Americans, particularly Chinese Americans. I'm not quite sure where the laughter is coming from, but if you want to heckle, you might just want to heckle out loud, um, you know, I, and, and I'm happy to take any questions afterwards. Um, and I think one of the biggest culprits of discrimination in America is one of our most elite institutions, and that is Harvard University, and that is why it is being sued. And in fact, another very elite institution just, the, just yesterday was notified that it was gonna be investigated by the Department of Justice also for discrimination against Asian Americans. Um, and oftentimes what you see from these elite institutions is their justification. Their justification is that they are pursuing diversity. So Harvard, after it got sued, said that its admissions policies do not discriminate against any applicant from any group, and yada, yada, and they will continue to keep doing this because they want a diverse group of students. Now, we heard a lot about how Harvard doesn't discriminate and Harvard will keep telling you that it doesn't discriminate because these days most racists will not tell you that they are in fact actually engaging in racism. But here are the statistics from Harvard itself. This is statistically mod statistical modeling from within Harvard. If admissions at Harvard were based purely on academics, you would get 43% Asian Americans. And they did some statistical modeling within the university and they asked, well, what if it's based on all kinds of other factors that Harvard cares about? Um, ath athletics, 
Legacy, legacy usually means lots and lots of white people who used to go to Harvard and who have money to give back to Harvard. Now, in reality, during those years that they did the modeling, the actual numbers weren't that different from this chart. So this chart says Asian Americans ended up being admitted at 18% when you consider factors like race, which is very important to Harvard University. And in the end, for those years, Asian Americans were admitted at 19%. Now let's go back to this one here. If academics were the only criteria used, Asian Americans would be admitted at 43%. And so, I'm sorry. I, um, and, and so Harvard continues to deny that, so what it says is race is indeed a factor that can contribute to a student's admission, but merely one factor among many, many others. That's what Harvard says. But here's what Harvard also has admitted. If they eliminated the consideration of race altogether, that would reduce the population of students who self-identify as African American, Hispanic, or other by nearly 50%. This is what happens when you can make race a consideration. This is the kind of consideration that Harvard uses because what Harvard cares a lot about is that it cares about money, which comes heavily from its white legacy community. And so a lot of white people get admitted because their parents went to Harvard, their grandparents went to Harvard, but Harvard also suffers from white guilt. It, it is at a point where it sees that, oh my gosh, we need to slash the number of Asian Americans who get in because we would feel so guilty. We would look so bad if we didn't have a higher number of African Americans, a higher number of Hispanics, a higher number of Native Americans. And so the biggest plus factor you can have applying to Harvard is being African American or being Native American. For Hispanics, it's similar, but it's to a much, much smaller extent. For Asians, if you're Asian and you're applying to Harvard, it is a big minus factor for you. And if you're an Asian trying to apply to Harvard, as an Asian American, your chances of getting in is 25%. And you go down that list. If you're white, it goes up to 35. If you're Hispanic, it goes up to 75. If you're an African American, that goes up to 95. Now, does that look like racism to you? Of course it does. The number come, is analysis, and I'm ha actually, let me finish, let me finish. I'm happy to entertain your question. I'm happy to entertain any and all questions after I'm done. Now, this is the man I worked for when I campaigned for Proposition 209 in California in 1996. He's the man who led a ballot initiative effort all across the country. Um, he's actually part Asian. Many people don't know this. He's part Asian, he's part black, he's part Asian, he's part white. And he said diversity is a legalized way of dis discriminating against different people. It is a great intrusion into individual liberty and individual, li uh, individual freedom and individual liberty. Um, and, and I think that has proven to be the case in this case, in, in the Harvard case that we see. We see evidence that is far more egregious than what ha we even thought or imagined was possible. Um, I'm going to actually skip through some of the other slides because I know we're short on time. I'm happy to take questions afterwards, but I think, I think the, there is a little bit of a dead end for Asian Americans at supporting, what, you know, whether it's racial preferences, affirmative action, what have you, because ultimately all of this is about racial grievance, and that is not what our community should be aiming for. I think our community ought to aim for diligence, it ought to aim for merit, for hard work, and also for achievement. Living your life by racial grievance is a complete dead end. It is, it is moronic, it is idiotic, and it is also immoral for all these universities to force you to work, to live your life that way, and to pursue that kind of a path. So if you, also I just wanna halt my book, Chinese Girl in the Ghetto, which will give you a different narrative about what it is to be, grow up poor, to grow up in a, an inner city environment, and to excel um, without asking for government but, benefit. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for the passionate presentation. Thanks. All right. Now we're going to get into our panel discussion time. Um, Julie, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Okay. My first question is about the personal rating. Uh, in a Harvard case. Um, SFFA found a gap between Harvard admission officers' personal rating and the personal rating by the students, uh, teachers, counselors, and the alumni. So um, 
Uh, they found that based on the teachers and counselors, and Asian American applicants have uh, almost identical personal rating compared to the whites. Um, but uh, the Harvard admission officer gave them in average a uh, lower personal rating. Um, there are people have different theories. The one theory is that um, probably other factors that is considered in the personal rating, uh, such as family SES of major choice, um, Asian American applicants in average fare worse. And the other theory is that. Um, Maybe uh, Harvard admission officers, they, they have some intentional or unconscious bias against the Asian Americans. Um, after all, uh, it's, 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 um, people might have that kind of unconscious bias. You cannot guarantee that immune to that, to that right, or stereotyping. Um, so um, I want to ask you this question. Um, for those two theories, which one do you think is more valid to explain the gap or carries more weight to explain the gap? Or you have um, other more fantastic theories about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sure. Is this on? Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Would I be able to just comment on one slide from the last presentation before we move on? Sure. Yeah, and I really appreciate this chance to be in dialogue. I mean, it's important for us to, that's how we stay sharp through dialoguing with people who have different perspectives. I guess the one slide I was a little confused about, and we could dialogue about this later, was the slide featuring, you know, supposedly the chances of admission being 25% for an Asian American applicant, and then each group having a higher chance of admissions. I guess the thing I don't understand about that slide is that we know that the overall rate for admissions at Harvard is 5% or slightly under. So actually I think that number is inflated for Asian Americans and I think what we might see is some statistical cherry picking. I do have a sense of where those numbers might be coming from but I think the interpretation might be a little different from what was presented. But that said, you know, um, you asked a great question about the personal rating. And so within that, I think your first question was, why might there be a discrepancy between, say, the teacher recommendations and then the overall personal rating that's given by the admissions officer? Yeah. So some of that, from my own personal experience in reading um, applications, you know, a teacher will have an interaction with a student and they'll have usually, you know, a small number of students who are really exceptional and those students will really stand out to them. So when they're writing a letter, they're going to say, this student is great. You should admit this student. This is my best student. However, an admissions officer gets all of those letters, thousands and thousands and thousands of applicants. So to read over and over again, this student is a great student. This student is a wonderful student. Um, it's almost kind of neutral, like it's just taken for granted. You would notice if the teacher says, this student's a bad student, then you're like, okay, maybe we shouldn't admit them, et cetera. So that's just a little bit of my own perspective about why there might be a discrepancy. One reason for part of the discrepancy between, say, the teacher recommendations versus the admissions officer and how they're creating the overall personal rating. I think in regards to the theories you presented, um, I would say part of it would be, I think, the first theory where there are additional components that the personal rating has a lot of components um, and especially I think the essay might be one where the essay is not scored, it's not given a number, um, and it potentially could be one factor because we don't have the numbers behind the essays that might be influencing. That while we know that we have lots of Asian American students who are great writers and are, you know, fantastic essay writers that you might have some students who aren't as strong in that area. So that could be one thing, but at the same time we also have things like socioeconomic status um, and um, the high school context and other things that might factor in. The other thing is that we have some research that suggests that overall the Asian American applicant pool applying to Harvard um, might be a little, it's broader, I would say, than other groups potentially, where for a lot of Asian Americans growing up, you're just told, like, you apply to Harvard, like, you just apply to Harvard, you might be great, you might be not that great, but you just apply to Harvard because your parents told you to, and it's just another check off the common application, it's another check, etc. Um, when you have that many students who are applying to Harvard, there's no guarantee that all of them are going to be stellar, exceptional students. We know that on average, they tend to have higher SAT scores and GPAs, but unfortunately, we all have known 
some people, right, who might have great test scores, but they might not have holistic excellence in every area. Um, and that's not every Asian American, of course, absolutely not. But when we think about how selective Harvard has to be, because there are so many Asian Americans who are putting their hat in the ring for Harvard, and that might include some students who have strong test scores, but might not have um, the passion or the grit in some areas, that is also something that um, admissions officers might take into consideration in making the personal rating. Thanks. Um, my second question for you is about the difference between discrimination and a racial conscious AA. Um, as many of us know, those are two different concepts, but uh, sometimes it's not that all straightforward um, for everyone. From the perspective of the mission process and the statistical analysis evidence, um, can you tell us some major factors for us to distinguish those two? Yeah, um, I mean, race conscious affirmative action is just at the, you know, what it makes possible is just knowing a student's race ethnicity and how that might come into play. There's no one straight way. Um, generally, there is some um, consideration that might be given to groups that are underrepresented historically and at the university level, but that's not a formula. That's not an automatic, like, that doesn't mean just because you're black you're getting in or just because you're Latino you're getting in. Um, so that's one thing to consider. The other important th thing to understand that what's at stake is the, at the, in this lawsuit is the charge of intentional discrimination by Harvard, um, which would be a very different, so in terms of you know admissions officers, they're looking at students, they're understanding what their race ethnicity is, they're trying to understand you know the entirety of their experience. Um, and that's a very different thing than I think intentional discrimination would be something like a ceiling or a cap or a quota, which we know is illegal, um, but they would have to find evidence that Harvard is doing those things that are illegal. Thanks. Um, that's all my question for you. Um, Brand, I'm going to ask you a set of questions, which is about the counts SFFA has brought against Harvard. So they have four counts. The first one is discrimination, second one, racial balancing. Third one, uh, they say Harvard failed to uh, consider race to achieve uh, critical mass. And the uh, last one is Harvard uh, failed to sufficiently consider other alternatives um, to achieve diversity and inclusion. So my first question to you is, we don't know if those allegations are true. Um, let's assume they were all true. Would that sufficiently lead to a court order banning racial conscious or formative action? Thank you. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I think that it's important to understand that SFFA is making four types of allegations, but essentially their two legal claims need to be separated. There's a claim of intentional discrimination, and there's also uh, an allegation that Harvard's race conscious admissions is actually operating as a penalty against Asian American applicants. There are separate legal standards and legal considerations that apply to a claim of intentional discrimination. And then there's another set of legal um, requirements in order to uh, ensure that a race conscious admissions policy is in fact constitutional. And with respect to the claim of intentional discrimination, essentially what um, the plaintiffs would have to demonstrate in this case is that uh, Asian, that is that Harvard is, an int is intentionally discriminating against Asian American applicants in favor of less qualified white applicants. So the legal comparison um, is between Asian American applicants and their uh, outcomes in the admission process and white applicants. And that's why it becomes significant um, in terms of what Professor Park has already identified. When you look at the admission rate between uh, white applicants and similarly situated um, Asian American applicants, you the, the data, the, the undisputed data, actually demonstrates that Asian American applicants are admitted at a slightly higher rate than white applicants. And so there is absolutely no evidence that um, the uh, admission process at Harvard is indicative of intentional discrimination against Asian Americans. With respect to the allegation that um, the holistic admissions process is operating uh, as a penalty against Asian American applicants, the challenge for, 
the plaintiffs in this case is that the sort of undisputed evidence really demonstrates that to the extent that there may be some bias uh, against Asian American applicants, it is more likely that this is associated with the special admit process. Um, so when you take a look at the data, um, and without it in front of me, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit challenged to identify what the actual numbers are, um, but I think it was perhaps in some of uh, Professor Park's slides. Um, but what you actually see is that um, when you do what the plaintiff's experts did in terms of the methodology that he chose to use, he eliminated um, the special admits from um, his statistical analysis, but when you fold those students back in, you actually um, can uh, see more clearly that uh, the greater uh, admit rate for um, white applicants is more likely associated with the fact that um, many of the students being under admitted under the special admit process are, uh, they, as was already mentioned and acknowledged, they tend to be um, uh, more white white applicants. Thanks. Sorry, I, I actually should follow up because you asked about the remedy. Yeah. Um, and I do think that um, I failed to answer that aspect of your question. So even if there were, um, if a court were to find that um, Harvard is engaging in intentional discrimination, it's really important to understand that the appropriate legal remedy for intentional discrimination is not the elimination of holistic admissions at Harvard. That honestly, um, the court would have a limited authority to impose that as a remedy for intentional discrimination because what the data is actually showing is that any kind of um, advantage that, uh, or I should say disadvantage, that Asian applicants are experiencing is not attributable. The data shows it is not attributable to holistic admissions that disadvantage Asian applicants in favor of Hispanic applicants or, um, uh, uh, sorry, African American applicants or other uh, racial minorities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's all my question for you. <laughs> Mike, it's your turn. Um, so, Mike, you have a lot of uh, famous articles, right? Um, in one of the articles, you celebrate that uh, the Trump administration um, has brought the admission policy back to Bush era, right? Uh, by rescinding the Obama era, uh, era admission policies. Um, I don't know if you know, uh, Bush himself is a strong supporter of diversity and inclusion. And in one of his statement, he has, um, America is a diverse country racially, economically, and ethnically, and our institutions of higher education should reflect our diversity. Um, in his turn, Texas adopted the policy that autom automatically admitted the top 10% of their students from their district. Um, to their state universities. Um, and that's actually very similar to what the New York mayor has proposed for the specialized high school. Um, so I want to ask you this question. How do you think of that alternative to achieve diversity and inclusion, which is uh, not consideration of race, uh, in two cases? Uh, first, uh, this specialized high school in New York. Second, generally for college admission. Thank you. Talk, uh, can you hear me? Yes. You're talking about what uh, what Bush did in Texas with a, the five percent of each high school gets into University of Texas. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's fine. That's that's a fine first approach. You know, when President Bush, whom I served in the, uh, the State Department, when he said he favored diversity in schools and in all society, of course he of course he would. So, so would I. You know, I want everybody to have equal opportunities. And, and I want everybody to have to succeed. So the question is, when you start using, and I think what, the, by the way, to answer very quickly what you asked about Mayor de Blasio, what he's trying to do to Stive or to uh, Bronx Science, I think that is awful. Uh, it's, he's destroying the jewels of the New York City public school system. Now, <clears throat> I actually, you know, I, I went to junior high in Queens, New York in the, in the 70s. A very bad junior high, by the way you know, because we were poor. And I wanted to go to Bronx Science. And I studied really hard to go to Bronx Science. Unfortunately, we moved to Florida, and I went to a high school in the South. 
So let's get back to how do we achieve what we want to achieve in society, which is an, a society where we have, all of us, have an equal opportunity and we're all treated equally and, and we're, we're really race blind. And that is, as you know, as Supreme Court Chief Justice Roberts said, maybe the way to stop racial discrimination is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. I don't think that it is, it is um, in any way defensible. To, it, in the Harvard case, and this is all going to be decided in, in court, that Asian Americans have been, have, have been stuck at like 19 percent for the last five or six years, well, Asian American ap applications have been going up. It, it, this is not, you know, how do you, how do you, how does one defend that? How do, how do you defend? You know, somebody asked earlier, what kind of society do we want to have? We want to have a meritocratic society, where you go, you get there by your ability, you get there by your merit, you get there by your hard work. A lot of, as I said before, a lot of you are immigrants, and you know that in this country we have this formula: we can succeed through hard work. We can succeed, and, and that doesn't mean that there aren't obstacles, such as the, the fact that there are idiots out there who discriminate against people. We're, not, we're never going to legislate evil out, but we should prosecute you know, cases of, of racial discrimination, and disc prosecute them hard. But what we should not do is, is respond to this by creating discrimination ourselves, especially now the government. We, the reason why there's such a, a strict scrutiny, as you know the cases say, it's because every time government, and I forget which case I'm, I'm quoting, but every time government uses categories, I think it's Pena, uh, Adoran versus Pena, every time government uses uh, race, any kind of race, racial category, it has to have strict scrutiny by the court, and that's the, the, the toughest standard, and that is because this is really very, you know, this is really difficult stuff. Uh, I, in my opinion, the government should be completely out of it, and anybody who uses government money should not be able to discriminate on the basis of race, and that includes Harvard, which gets about, what, half a billion dollars a year in federal uh, money. Um, you know, it, it, if, if it's found to be in violation of Title, of Title VII, then it should stop doing what it's doing. And we don't know how the court case is gonna end up, and obviously it's going to end up in another court, and another court, and another court, and we'll, we'll just have to follow it. Thanks. Thanks. Um, what do you think um, other viable and reasonable uh, ways to achieve diversity and inclusion? Sorry, to achieve what? Diversity and inclusion. Uh, as I said, I think that by, so government has a, a bully pulpit, right? Government can send out messages. Government can send a message that intact families are a good idea. And, and it's a, from the founders understood this, that the government has a very important role to play in virtue in society, and if you if the government continues to you know start sending the message, look, intact families are a good idea. It, they're good for the children, especially uh, uh, education. It's not it's not it's not a white thing. Education is a good thing, and President Obama was good on this, by the way. He fought against that. Uh, doing homework, staying at home and doing homework, it's not the the proclivity of. It shouldn't be, should not be the proclivity of any one group. It should be something that we all do. Um, so I think that you reach, you achieve diversity truly by sending out this message and by making sure that there's no discrimination. And I don't see any reason why you wouldn't end up obtaining diversity in the end, uh, because I actually think you know we're all men are created equal. Okay. Um, last question for you. Yes, Some activists for you. Some activists uh, think that a Harvard lawsuit effectively divides the, color, the, the community of color, Asians and African-Americans, Hispanics. Um, uh, do you want to comment on that? What, what is identity politics? Identity politics is a creation and the fostering of antagonistic groups, ethnic or racial groups, or uh, ba groups based on ethnicity or race or sex. The government should not be doing this stuff. That is the divisive issue. That is the divisive uh, policy. And by the way, I, again, this is very recent. This is something that began to be done in the 70s. Hispanics were created in, 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 you know, in, in, the, in the 70s as a, as a pan-ethnic pan group. Asian Americans were created in the 70s as a pan-ethnic group. You yourselves know that Asian Americans doesn't really, they, 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 as I always say, the highest rate of uh, small government formation in this country is Korean Americans, 
One of the lowest rates is the Ocean Americans. So to speak of a nation American business formation rate is tantamount to saying that Tom Brady and I each averaged 16 touchdown passes last season. It is a statistic and it's true, but it's meaningless. Uh, so these groups shed no light on, on, on policy making, should shed no light on policy making. Thank you. Um, Ying, yeah, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Um, so my question for you is about the Office of Internal Research Study from Harvard that you shared with us. Um, um, Harvard stated that uh, this analysis by OIR is incomplete based on limited sample, and they had their own expert, Dr. Cott from Berkeley University, uh, conduct analysis based on uh, student applicants' body from 2014 to 19. It's the domestic applicants' body, the universe of the applicants through those years instead of us a limited sample. And they control um, more variables that is important uh, in during the, uh, the pro admission process. Um, and they found that if you control everything, everything that's important um, for consideration for admission, you will find Asian American applicants has the same chance of being admitted, everything else being equal compared to whites. Would you like to comment on that? Sure. So I think this Harvard case is going to end up being a battle of statistics because I, I am aware of the arguments that Harvard is making. Um, what the plaintiffs have done is that they have the, the expert on the plaintiff side has actually added in you know, all, a num the statistics that Har um, a number of the factors that Harvard said the plaintiff's expert did not use, the, the expert on the plaintiff's side has also run the numbers according to some of these extra criteria or extra data that Harvard said that the plaintiffs did not have from the Office of Internal Studies and so on. And so um, on the plaintiff's side, after they've run the numbers, what they claim is that in fact, if you add in all of these things that Harvard said that was not included the first time, um, there's actually little statistical significance um, and that the plaintiffs stand by their original assertions and that in fact, if, in fact, actually other people have since then run the numbers that come out, that have come out from Harvard's internal study and, you know, and, and so for instance, the Center for uh, Equal Opportunity, for instance, has e issued a study and they were an independent, you know, sort of a third party that has actually said that being Asian is a big minus factor, and, and if you apply to Harvard as an African American, that is a huge plus factor for you. So, so it's not just Harvard um, that has presented the numbers, but um, but I think that all these new numbers, new data, and and new arguments that Harvard has presented in the lawsuit has actually been reevaluated by the plaintiff side as well as by others, and and there's um, and I there's great dispute about. Harvard's assertions. Now, however, I think ultimately what will happen is that when the when the case proceeds and we're expected to hear oral arguments on starting on October 15th, I think the courts are going to have to, well, the court in Boston starting there, I think that there's going to have to be evaluation of, of which side's data and which side's statistics um, is more credible, more correct. And I, I think that's a battle that's going to have to be played out because I think you're right, much of this but I mean, not all of it, not all of it, but a great part of this does have to do with the data and the credibility of the data presented by each side. But I, I do think that there is an answer from the plaintiffs regarding, regarding what Harvard has said as well. Thanks. Um, Dr. Park, are you familiar with those uh, analysis? Um, do you want to comment? Um, I'm familiar with the plaintiff's analysis. I'm not with, oh, sorry. I'm familiar with the I'm familiar with the plaintiff's analysis. I'm not familiar with the second one, the Center for Equal Opportunity Analysis. But yeah, I think you are right. A lot of it will hinge on um, people's interpretation of statistics. And it's very tricky because uh, judges aren't necessarily <laughs> trained in interpreting social science data. Um, but yeah, I mean, a big part of the disagreement, I think, uh, goes back to the sample, basically, and um, different decisions that were made by the experts in uh, the base sample, and who was included in the sample and who wasn't included. I think it's important to note, though, that both analyses have found, you know, for, um, in statistics in general, you're interested in looking at how many, with all the variables that you control for, um, I think he's trying 
get your attention. With all the variables and you know, after you crunch all the numbers, how much of the variation are you able to explain? And in most studies, there's always this percentage of variation that you're actually not able to explain in the model, um, which represents a certain degree of uncertainty. And so in this case, with both of the experts, I think it ends up being somewhere around 30%. And so it leads, you know, on one hand, the analyses do provide sort of a good starting point to think about sort of the big pictures and the trends, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, um, the way admissions works sort of at the most competitive level, it's a combination of art and science. Um, it's not a strict formula. And the way that you might predict someone's likelihood of getting in always isn't a cut and dry thing when you're actually looking at real people and trying to assess them as individuals. Thank you. Um, I have a lot more question for you guys, but um, I think we're approaching the deadline very soon. Um, we started late, so um, we started um, 3.45, is that right? Right? So we have until 5.15, so we still have 15 minutes. We'll speak fast. <laughs> All right, um, first question um, is for Mike. What do you think of a legacy program? Legacy programs. Um, Preference. Well, that's changing the subject, uh, but I, look, we have a system uh, that relies on donations. And I understand Harvard and Yale and Princeton, even though they, they, they have all the money in the world, they want to get more donations. Uh, so I don't know how you get around that uh, unless we give them more money, still more taxpayer money, which I'm against. Um, so I don't, I don't know, I, I, I don't like it. But it's not the issue that we're discussing. It's not really the issue that I find particularly offensive, which is government racial classifications and, and, and giving benefits and penalties to people si simply as a consequence of being a member of a group. So in that case, I'm not as, 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 as opposed to it, although I, I, yeah, it's, not, it's, it's not great. Uh, but what, how, how are we going to how are we going to make up for the amount of money that Princeton raises from the, the, its legacies? Um, we have two lawyers here. Do you like to comment on the legality of um, legacy preference? So, can you hear me? Um, I think that what is important to think about here is the extent to which if there is a difference in terms of the admission rate or your chance of admission, um, that appears to fall along racial lines, how much of that is actually explained by race, race conscious admissions and how much of, how much of that is actually attributable, attributable to legacy. And I think that um, the initial data analysis that has been conducted by the, ex, by the experts, both experts for both parties in this case, um, is reflective of the fact that uh, to the extent that there may in fact be um, some differential that is falling along racial lines, it may not be evidence of racial discrimination. It may actually be more properly attributable to um, legacy, not just legacy, but legacy and all of the other special admits, um, admit categories, which does not trigger um, a legal violation or discrimination in this case. But could I could I just add something really quickly? So. Um, in the uh, in the modeling that um, Harvard did internally, um, you know, so they if they admitted people based on academics plus legacy plus you know recruited athletes, which is also another category that they use, Asian Americans would still make up 31 percent of that hypothetical student body, and that's still a whole lot more than the actual numbers um, for that for the period of, that the modeling took place and, and the actual admit rate during that period was 19%. And so even, so I, I mean, much like Mike, I'm not a big fan of, of universities using legacies, but I think that is a separate issue. Um, and that, so let's say 
let's say all the legacies went away and like Harvard stopped or other elite universities stopped using that criteria, you would still have a smaller number of Asian applicants based on other, um, based on other factors, particularly the race factor and, and additionally the personal rating factor at Harvard. And so that, there is actually quite a big discrepancy even if we take away the legacy consideration. Um, I, I actually wanted to point out one of the um, maybe inaccuracy in your slides, um, the force model that you shared from the ORA, um, they actually controlled the demographic information. So as far as I know, demographic information includes age, gender, race. So it's not just the race and ethnicity. So if you assume those results are true, that there's no bias from a sample of, of variable controlling, all those things are gone. We, it, it's, it is still inaccurate to suggest that, that the reduction from 26% to 18% is solo, solely attributed, attributed to race. That's Harvard making that case. They, they, the plaintiffs are not accepting that. Harvard is making that case that it is inaccurate. We'll find out when it comes to trial. Um, it, it's actually SFFA's document. In SFFA's document, they put its demographic information instead of race and ethnicity. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think actually there's a, a little bit of, of misunderstanding about what Harvard is doing and what SFFA is doing. Um, I, I think again, you know, the, the experts' reports are really long, and, I, and I've had to slog through the multiple reports from, from both sides. But but I, I think one of the arguments that the plaintiffs are making is that. Harvard has added in a whole bunch of factors and said those factors are important, whereas once the plaintiffs actually ran those numbers, so, and the factors include everything from, you know, where you went to high school, what major do you want to study, um, what's your parents' occupation, and Harvard is arguing that all of that makes a difference in terms of whether an Asian applicant gets in or not, and that it's not the race issue, and whereas the, when the plaintiffs actually added in and did their st statistical modeling differently, they're saying that's actually not significant significant at all and that, you, you know, um, and that if we run the numbers our way, we stand by our results. And so I think um, this is probably not the best place to have an argument about whose statistics is correct. Ultimately, it's going to have to be decided by the court. But, but I think a more important factor is that even is that when you look at what Harvard has claimed that what Harvard wants and, and, and Harvard's insistence on having this so-called diverse student body and that Harvard's insistence that if they didn't use race that the number or, or the percentage of these so-called underrepre underrepresented minorities will go way down. Um, that is a very good way of discerning what Harvard is doing and that goes back to what I said at the beginning of my presentation which is that this diversity idea is purely a charade. It is a result of very tortuous legal reasoning from the Supreme Court. Um, unfortunately, I mean, we do have settled law in this land, and, and I, I think this case is going to push that, and it's going to push the envelope, but I, I think we need to keep in mind that Harvard actually makes it very clear, makes it very clear what they're interested in, and, and that is that race is something that they're very interested in, and racial preferences is what it wants to continue doing. Just a quick note to respond. Oh, this mic. A quick note to respond to that last point. I think, yes, the policies do matter. Um, you know, when you have so many talented students, right, at the top, um, you know, the race conscious admissions is important to be able to support racially diverse student bodies. I don't think there's any uh, surprise or question about that. I think it is important, though, that in that same analysis that Harvard found that they, if they were to end consideration of race, you would see very little difference in Asian American enrollment, and you would see marked increases in white student enrollment is what you would see. And you would see dramatic drops um, in underrepresented minority students. But that, those would be largely be replaced by white students and not Asian Americans. And just one um, small, sorry, um, just one small additional piece of context. When um, we when we say that the um, number of African American students admitted uh, at Harvard would drop by 50% if race were eliminated. It's because the number of African-American students who are currently admitted 
at Harvard right now is so low. So essentially, um, we do know for a fact, and this part is, this is actually not disputed, that although Asian Americans represent 6% of the student population, they're actually admitted at Harvard um, somewhere along the lines between 20 to 23%, I think is the most recent figure. And I also think that in terms of um, trying to understand whether there is in fact a cap or a um, limit on the number of Asian Americans admitted at Harvard, both experts concede that there is a fluctuation and variation in not just the percentage um, admit rate for Asian American students, but for other racial groups as well. And I understand that there are very um, different opinions about how to interpret some of that data, but I think that, again, it is true we're going to be relying on a court um, to uh, attach legal significance to some of this data, but I do think that it's important to understand that um, the methodological choices that any statistician or analyst is making um, can uh, skew the outcome of their conclusions and that we have to be very careful about the significance that we're attaching to a lot of that analysis. Thank you. Uh, let's move to another question. Do you think Hollis admission policy is too subjective, thus vulnerable to discrimination and bias? I guess vulnerable to abuse to discrimination of bias. Yeah. Um, from my own personal experience with this type of process, I don't think so. There are a lot of checks and balances built in, and if you look at how Harvard um, goes about, there's a very thorough, you know, each student is given a lot of individual treatment. Those folders and files are read by multiple people. There are committee reads. There are long discussions. Um, I do recognize that, yeah, it would be a lot easier and tidier if you just had score cutoffs, right? It would seem like that's the way to go, but you know, if you are admitting a relatively small number of students and you're trying to get kind of this eclectic mix of exceptional talents, that takes a lot of individual attention um, that test scores just don't capture. Can I add something to that? So the term holistic is a nice term. It means every, it, taking account of everything, of all the criteria. It hides the fact that one of those criteria is race. Okay, so holistic means that race will be considered. And I just don't know. And I'm sorry I'm passionate about this. In the year of 2018, how can we still be making decisions on the basis of race? Whether it's holistic, a factor of a factor of a factor, you know, what this is, is this, I, I just, I'm baffled. I will say though, um, universities are not allowed to make decisions solely on the basis of race. That is something that is clear both in the that policy is, and the law. I understand. Very happy that GPAs and SAT scores are still considered, <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but race, but, but perhaps I'm proposing that that should be really the only consideration, maybe extracurricular activities, and maybe the kids' background, socioeconomic background, that matters a lot too. Just not race or ethnicity, especially an imposed one from, by, by, by the government. I know you want to answer that, Brenda. Sure, and I think that it's, first of all, I just want to make um, a slight correction to one of the comments that was made earlier. Harvard has not stated that it is invested in continuing racial preferences. Over and over again, Harvard has made it clear that they are not engaging either in intentional discrimination or applying their holistic admission policies inconsistent with the law, which requires that those policies be narrowly tailored. And as... Um, the professor has already mentioned, essentially, not only is race not um, allowed to be um, the sole factor, race is not um, constitutionally allowed to be the predominant factor in the, um, the, the decision-making process in college admissions. And when we take a look at the data, what the data actually shows is that race is not the predominant factor in essentially determining whether any of our applicants, including Asian American applicants, are going to be offered um, admission you know, at these elite institutions. And I have to say that um, because the Lawyers Committee represents a number of underrepresented minority students, those students have had an opportunity to review their, uh, their application, their admission file, at Harvard, and there is even um, 
within the um, Asian American students that we represent, there is a great deal of diversity in terms of their racial background, their um, whether they are the child of immigrant parents, their socioeconomic status, their high school um, activities, their grade point average, their um, standardized test scores, and those students have reviewed their files and concluded for themselves that race played a positive factor in um, their admission to Harvard. And so I think it's really inaccurate to say that in every instance, in unilaterally and across the board, um, being an Asian American, including a Chinese American um, applicant to Harvard, is viewed as a negative or you are being penalized um, as a result of your disclosing your race and ethnicity. I also think it's just important as a baseline um, factor, uh, fact to, to put on the table. Um, the students, applicants to Harvard are not required to disclose their race. So there are thousands of applicants to Harvard who do not disclose their race on their application. And if they do not, Harvard does not engage in any investigation to determine their race. They don't use or attempt to use things like last names in order to identify the racial or ethnic background of the applicants. And moreover, um, if a, th th so students are self-identifying their race, there's no investigation by the institution to determine whether um, race is being reported accurately. So these are not state-imposed racial categories. Sorry. Thanks, thanks. I'd like to take, I know this is not scientific and you don't want to, you would be revealing yourself by doing, I want to take an informal poll. How many of you think that your children will be disadvantaged in applying to an elite school like Harvard because they're Asian or Chinese American? Raise your hands. That's, that's how many of you think that your children will be disadvantaged in applying to Harvard or Princeton or any other elite school because of the Chinese last name? That's the question I'm asking. That's, that's, a, good, five, six, that's a good number. I would expect more, but okay. Well, do the, do the um, so we have two minutes. Uh, we're going to have ask you a final question. Do you could, I'm sorry, could I inter interject here? Because I, I, I know a lot of times for these polls, there are people who don't vote. Could I ask the, alter the, the reverse of that, which is how many of you do not think that your children will be disadvantaged um, when they apply to elite universities because they're Chinese? I had more hands. <laughs> so last question. Um, uh, should race conscious policy be replaced with social economic status based policy? Yeah. Can. Universities can and should consider both. Um, it's really important. Um, we have research that shows that elite universities do could give considerable um, favor to low-income students of color, including Asian Americans. And so the answer, I think, is not to do away with consideration of race, but to just to be able to consider both, to especially give um, special consideration to low-income Asian American students who may have not had all of the advantages and resources in their educational opportunities. And just as a point of fact, both Harvard and UNC, which are um, whose policies are being challenged today, they do in fact consider socioeconomic status in addition to race. And I think that there is a great deal of research that shows that if racial diversity at all matters to an institution, to use um, just socioeconomic status makes it very difficult for an institution to maintain the same level of racial diversity on their college campuses. And I am obviously also for considering uh, socioeconomic background, whether you're a Chinese American kid from Queens or a white kid from Appalachia or a kid named Gonzalez, that really should not matter. But the, what should matter is if you have surmounted great odds because uh, and, and you have still you have, you have done well, yeah, you deserve special consideration because you have, you have faced incredible odds and you, you have still done well. But the kid of a, the, the, the child of a doctor or a lawyer merely as a consequence of being one of these protected groups, who can defend that? How is that defensible? So since I grew up in the inner city, um, I, I guess I do have special fondness for people who emerge out of poverty, who emerge out of less than desirable circumstances. And, and I mean that not just for minorities. If you're a white guy who grew up in um, rural Appalachia, um, and, I, I, and then you apply yourself, I, I think those guys actually ought to um, 
ought to be considered for the effort that they've made as well. Um, so there are certainly all kinds of ways one can consider an applicant based on non-racial um, non factors and whether it's socioeconomic or others. And I think the, one of the, the allegations that the plaintiffs make in the Harvard lawsuit is that the university has not um, actually done enough to use race-neutral um, criteria. Now, if I could just actually mention one thing very quickly about what we said earlier um, about Asian kids getting into um, elite universities or not. I think no matter what you believe, there are lots of people, lots of consultants these days um, who advise Asian kids who apply to elite universities to hide their race. I'm not saying that the university actually will go and investigate what your race is, but the, the fact that so many Asian kids have to hide their race, not just their race, but their extracurricular activities, to go out of their way not to play the violin, not to play the piano, not to study Chinese, things like that. I think it is egregious and it is tragic. And so no matter what happens in this lawsuit, I think this lawsuit in many ways is about legal arguments and we'll find out what the court in Boston decides and it may actually go all the way to, up to the Supreme Court. But no matter what, there's something incredibly immoral about these practices and that there's no reason why Asian kids, Chinese kids should be doing any of that kind of meddling because they are afraid that Harvard might not want them because they're thank Chinese. You, thank you very much. Um, we're awfully out of time. Thank you. A huge thank you to every one of you for presenting <laughs> great discussions. And very good questions from you guys, too. All right, um, I think our, our next agenda is the um, manifesto thing, right? All right. <laughs>